Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I'm your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Joining me, my co-host, Steve Evans. Welcome, sir. Good day, Noah. How was your day today? Hey, you know what, Steve? It's been a good day, and it has been an even better week. And I, I had some had some challenges to get through, but I got through them, and I'm here and uh, ready to geek out with you. Sounds like a plan. How about you? Did you have a good week? I had a wonderful week. I uh, I got into a bunch of various activities from sequencing my Christmas tree to doing some hardware hacking and a uh, little bit of home, home automation stuff and everything in between. So here's the deal. I've... I've automated Christmas tree lights. I've never automated my Christmas tree. And the thing that I think is particularly unique about that is you've done that with Home Assistant. Tell me about that. So what I did is Home Assistant sits on its own little um, machine, and I have a receiver that can play MP3s and stuff like that. So what happens is you click the button to start a song, and Home Assistant will send the MP3 to the receiver and then trigger the Raspberry Pi that is attached to the tree to play a specific sequence. And then you just sit back and watch it go. So how are you sequencing from the Raspberry Pi? Are you using GPIO or something in between there? Yeah, use the GPIO pins. Well, there is a single GPIO pin. There's something called the NeoPixel library in Python, and it's also available in C++ and a few other languages that uh, essentially helps to deal with individual addressable LEDs. And on top of that, I have some solid state um, relays that control the on and off of just traditional lights that that just simply, you know, they're all lit up or they're all not lit up. And did I, I understand that you purchased some little small controllers from China that you can flash new firmware on them. Tell me a little bit about those. Yeah, so um, there's it's not a very big secret anymore, but there's a bunch of uh, Bluetooth temperature and humidity uh, sensors from Acara and, or is it Acara? I don't really remember. They're about three or $4 that you can get them. Um, I tend to get mine from cloudfree.shop because uh, those guys are awesome. But essentially you get these little guys and they broadcast on Bluetooth. Um, I should correct myself. They don't broadcast on Bluetooth out of the box. They are Bluetooth enabled and you pair your phone or the app to it, but you can get this open source firmware and flash it on there. And then they become beacons and they just broadcast all of their Bluetooth packets out in the open and anything that can sniff Bluetooth then can grab that. So I have paired that with an ESP32 chip and it just listens on, it listens for specific Mac addresses and grabs those and throws that into MQTT, which is picked up by Home Assistant and voila, you've got $3 temperature sensors with you know, a nice readout where it actually on the device itself has a little screen. And so now you're able to automate even your cooking or, or well, your wife's cooking. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that was a little different project. So there, it's a similar process. There's a, um, like a thermometer for cooking, barbecuing or whatever, and it broadcasts via Bluetooth. That one didn't require any hacking. It just requires that you don't pair it to your phone because by default, it throws its packets out there and uh, someone has gone through the process of actually breaking the encryption for these particular devices. And so it's the same thing where there's a, a project out there that's called the Open MQTT Gateway and it knows how to decode those packets and the same process. It, it broadcasts its temperature for each probe and then that gets picked up by Home Assistant and away you go. So where is your line for this stuff? So you're kind of like me, you prefer it to be open source, you prefer it to be open firmware, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and you don't like cloud connected things. So how do you draw the line between, hey, this is a thing that's intended for cloud, but I don't have to have the internet to do that. 
And where is your line where just, I'm not putting that in my house? So if I can't make it work locally, uh, the general rule is it doesn't go in my house because I, I shovel things all off onto what I call my IoT network to begin with on a different VLAN. So if it can't work there, it can't really work in my house. So since this thing doesn't require internet connectivity, um, you know, it just broadcasts its Bluetooth. And if you know how to grab them, you're good. And so I guess my line is, can it work offline? If it can work offline, that makes it a possible buy. And if it has open source firmware or some other way to interact with it, uh, that, that makes it a buy. And do you have internet on your IoT VLAN? Do you allow them to talk out to the internet or is that IoT is segregated? So like I kind of do it the opposite, right? Like at my house, my IoT VLAN, the only thing you can get to is the internet. It doesn't let you talk on the network. Um, and my assumption is, or my, my rationale with that is that, okay, so you're a thing that wants to get out to the internet. You go do your internet thing and leave everything on my network alone. It sounds like you're taking the opposite approach. You're saying, hey, if you desire to be, if you're not, if you're not a local device, I'm going to keep you from the internet and then I'll make you be a local device or we'll find some ways to work around your desire to get out to the internet. Yeah, it depends on, so I have a couple of um, device VLANs. So the IoT VLAN specifically can uh, can get out to the internet, but it's super, super throttled um, and it's got no restriction. And then I've got a VLAN for my thermostat, which shouldn't go out to the internet. And so I use that for the things that, you know, you should never put this on the internet kind of classification. Sure. No, that makes sense. So home automation continues and the fun continues. And now with the Christmas spirit. Yeah. And it's uh, something that's interesting to watch my wife get excited in this. She's like, Hey, can you do this song? Do this one now. <laughs> the wife approval factor. Our first email comes in from Dustin. Dustin writes in and says, Hey, no one, Steve, we are looking to use planning center check-ins after the first of the year. I would love to have some open source solutions for my check-in stations. Has anyone used a Pi for the check-in station? And were you able to get the printer working? Is there a touchscreen solution to pair with a Pi for the purpose that won't break the bank? I'm in charge of all the tech at my church. I would love to have a place that has discussions about Linux and open source solutions in the church tech world. I know that not all of your audience is going to be as interested in the subject as I am, but there seems to be a fair amount of your listeners that are involved with church tech. Thanks, Dustin. So, uh, thanks for the email, Dustin. Uh, we, our church just switched over to, to Planning Center completely. We're using their services app to coordinate uh, some of our stuff. We switched over to the rest of Planning Center. So here, here's what I'll tell you. If you want your printers to last the, uh, the test of time, you have to, have to, have to, have to, absolutely have to, have to, have to have a label cutter. The reason for that is if you don't have a label cutter, when people walk up to the printers to, to use the check-in kiosks, they pull on them and it grinds the little gears. Now, with Planning Center specifically, they support almost every printer, mobile printer under the sun. So really what you're looking for when you're shopping for printers for Planning Center is find ones that will uh, work with Bluetooth. And that's kind of your bottom bottom tier entry. And and they have a universal driver that will work with, with most of those printers. Now, if you're looking for the, the best of the best, the best printers that I have found are Zebra printers. They are pricey. I think they were seven $800, and then I think the label cutter was a few hundred dollars on top of that. Um, so they're, they're pricey. However, the configuration options are fantastic. They don't jam up. The way that they can auto sense the label and the size of the label and all of those things work fantastically. Uh, and the, the biggest thing is they're one of the only manufacturers that come with an external label cutter. So it chops the label and spits it out at the person so they don't have the opportunity to grab onto the end of the label roll and pull nine labels out and strip the plastic gears in the process. Um, if you want one step below those, I highly recommend the Citizen printers. The Citizen printers, the advantage over the Zebra printers is, one, they're a little bit cheaper. Two, they're battery powered, which means that you can charge them up and then you can use like double side, you can use like Velcro to uh, adhere them to underneath the kiosk. And then you can have like a totally portable little kiosk thing, which was great if you ever do your services outside of the actual facility. Uh, the downside to them is they don't have a label cutter, which means that we burn through them pretty quick. Um, bought a printer, and I think once every two, three years, uh, they get they get the, the 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 little plastic gears get jammed out because people just just tug on them. Um, and so we tried to fix that with signage and some hey, please treat the printers nicely, that kind of stuff. And but if you really want them to last, if you're asking about printers, strongly suggest 
uh, getting a, a zebra printer. And I, I don't think you'll think twice about that. As far as open source solutions, so here's the deal. When they first launched check-in, for the longest time, they were doing it through a web app. And so you could go to um, just the URL and, and do the check-in through the web app. They have since switched from that over to having Mac, Mac, uh, Windows, Android, and iOS support, and there's actual apps for that. And their rationale for that was that inside of the Chrome browser, it would update, and then it would lose access to the printers, and then the whole check-in station would stop working. And so they switched to apps, and as part of doing that, has kind of broke using anything other than the quote-unquote traditional operating systems to get it done. So I'll throw it out there. We'll read the email. And certainly there's somebody out there that's, hey, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have the perfect solution to that. And if you do, um, write in. But at the moment, if, if, you're, if you're looking to do it, probably your, your, your most straightforward way is to purchase a Zebra label printer with a, um, with a label cutter and then get some sort of a mobile tablet of sorts, put it inside of a kiosk enclosure, pair it, and uh, away you'll go. And let me know how the how the migration goes. We've absolutely loved ours. Our second email comes in from uh, Charlie. Charlie writes in and says, G'day, Stephen Noah and listeners. In one of your recent shows, you discussed using audio interfaces instead of a hat. Plenty of these are available from Amazon USA, AliExpress, for $100. This is a great idea. And then he lists to the Behringer Audio Interface, the XTUGAE22, the UShare USB Audio Interface, and the LVY. USB audio interface, and he has a couple links to some Ally Express ones as well. Or you can support your local music store, community, town, district, or region. Also, why not use studio monitor speakers for the sound? I myself have Yamaha HS8 monitor speakers, and I can blast out of four of these and dial a range of my windows vibrate, and I get zero headaches from the bass. Then again, older people may not even notice the quality from a monitor speakers in the $100 to $200 range for the pair versus $300, $350 to $500 for the pair. Maybe what these people need is an external dial, a knob, or button panel to control the device without a keyboard and mouse, which can turn off the Pi computing device by hitting the classic red button. All the best from down under. Hey, we appreciate that. It's a great thought. Um, I have gone to controlling... I think we talked about Volumio there. I've gone to controlling Volumio either from Home Assistant or I have uh, started to use the Lutron buttons um, and monitor the lights of those buttons. And so I have like a play, a stop, a load a specific playlist, those kinds of things. And so I get home and load my you know, after work playlist, bedtime playlist, wake up playlist, that kind of stuff. Um, so and I, I like the physical control of it, but... Um, I like the idea of having an external knob or external button panel. If you have a suggestion, I'd be interested in hearing it again. I've, I've used the Lutron one. How about you, Steve? Do you have any music tied into your home assistant? Not, well, I suppose not outside of the Christmas stuff, but we do a lot with buttons around the house. So we get like these cheap uh, Zigbee buttons. And it's a similar idea where I've replaced light switches in the kids' room with these Zigbee buttons that do various things because you can, you know, depending on the button, you can single tap, double tap, push and hold or some of them go like ridiculous like you can do up to five pushes or you know some form of morris code as far as i can tell to get different signals in and out very cool uh, our questions bot which you can access by messaging at questions colon linux delta.com in the geek lab you can learn more at geeklab.ninja Tim asked, I'm seeking recommendations or advice. I'm looking to get a new to me external audio interface for music recording in Linux. I have a Firewire PreSonus rack unit, eight in, eight out, and that works with my desktop. Neither are seeing much use since I moved into a motorhome, though I'm looking to build out a rack for my overhead cabinets, and this is not my focus here. I have a PC Express Card Firewire interface for my ThinkPad, but the PreSonus is cumbersome with regard to portability. My ThinkPad has been great. It's a W540, but it's heavy and big, and maybe slightly long in the tooth. I have a new Frameworks laptop about to arrive. It has great I.O. options. Firewire and PC Express Card are among those available to me. My questions are, do you have any experience with USB or Thunderbolt Pro audio devices in Linux? I seem to recall that some Focusrite units work well with Linux, but I'm unsure which models or generations to seek or avoid. Maybe there are other brands that are better. My requirements? Quality. Audio. Preamps? This is primary. Balanced XLR with phantom power is desired. An integrated mini interface is also desired. Portable matters. So maybe not a rack unit, but that's not a deal breaker. I'm hoping to spend less than $300, so quality used gear is fine. My use case, 
I'll be recording guitars, bass, and various mics for drums, an acoustic guitar, and vocals. Occasionally, I'll use a MIDI piano. Outputs will include feeding a headphone distribution amp, monitors, PA, etc. Software I use is Ardour, Audacity, GuitarX, Mix, but I don't think that matters. So long as it works with Jack and Pipewire, I'll be good to go. Thanks so much for the show, and thanks in advance for any suggestions you may have for me. Thanks, Tim L. So, Tim, uh, here's what I would say. I would start with this. So you're right when you talk about Focusrite. Focusrite has had consistently good Linux support all throughout. Now, I'll start at the high end, and I'm going to work my way down. I'm sorry. I'm going to start at the low end. I'm going to work my way up. So with the Focusrite, I would avoid the Solo because it's a mono device, and I, if I were you, I'd get the 2i2. It's only a little bit more expensive, and then you get two XLR inputs, two things that can power Phantom uh, power, or you can turn those inputs into line level and record them at line level. I would tell you that the focus right, the quality of the audio input that comes into the focus right is right up there with the top of the top. If I recorded you a sample on a focus right and I went back and recorded uh, with um, something like the, the Apollo Twin or the Motu uh, A96 and sent you the samples, I highly doubt you would be able to tell the difference of which one came from the $150 interface and which one came from the $2,000 plus interface, okay? Um, but if you want to move up in the world from uh, focus right. I would say that PreSonus is probably in the same range, but they offer a little wider range of options. And so you can buy a larger mixer that can accommodate more simultaneous channels. Now, when you talk about recording bass and drum, or excuse me, bass and guitar, not such a big deal. You can probably get away with one or two channels. When you mention drums, I start to take a step back and go, <gasps> I was just working with a guy and we were working out his, his, uh, his little home studio. And his problem was he was having to record all of the drum tracks uh, at separate times. So ideally, you would have a separate mic on every uh, every voice of the drum set, one for each time, two overheads for cymbals, one on the hat, one on the snare, one on the bass drum, right? And the idea there is you can EQ each one of them differently. You can apply different compression to each one of them. And most importantly, you can adjust the volume so that the overall mix sounds good. And so you've got a couple different ways you can do that. If you're playing with a click track, you can uh, just record over and over and over again. First time, capture the snare. Second time, capture the kick. Third time, capture the tom. Fourth time, capture the overhead. So on and so forth. But if you have enough inputs, and so you purchase like an eight uh, an eight put input unit, you, that's ideal. Um, so I would I might suggest considering that. If you if quality is what matters and you're saying, hey, how high can I go on Linux without any compromise? The RME Babyface is one of the best audio interfaces I've ever used. It is absolutely fantastic and it works flawlessly uh, with Linux. And so the audio quality is going to be right up there with the Apollos, right up there with the Motus. Um, and there's a lot of processing that's in there. You're right. You can use any uh, software that you like. So it'll work with Reaper. It'll work with our doer, it will work with Audacity. Um, and so, yeah, let me know how that works. Uh, if you're looking for under $300, I think you're probably focusing on the focus right, no pun intended. Again, 855-450-NOAH, that's 855-450-6624, the email live at asknoahshow.com. That is how you make your voice heard and become part of the program. Cody is with us from Grand Forks. Hey, Cody, welcome to the program. Hey, Noah, good to talk to you again. Same. <clears throat> Say, I... Uh started my, my journey down the home assistant road and I've been experimenting with it and I, it's, it's great. Uh, now I'm starting to get serious with it and I've been making little devices to, uh, to monitor certain things around my home. And some of, these, some of the output of the devices that I'm monitoring, uh, you know, I want uh, some sort of notification on my, my mobile phone or tablet or something. And I guess what I've kind of set up so far is uh, I've integrated everything with Telegram. And so right now, you know, the system, you know, some device output, whatever. But the Telegram notification just kind of pops open briefly, and then it just there's that little Telegram icon in my, my status bar. And so what I'm looking for is some, some of the more important alerts you know, I'd like something to really catch my attention or to continue flashing on my phone, you know, to, to, to tell me, hey, there's something you really got to look at here. Is there some sort of home assistant integration I can I can set up for that? Or is that going to be more like a, a third party like task or integration on my phone that I got to work with? Yeah, that's such a good question. Steve, what are your thoughts? 
I would first say, have you looked into the Home Assistant app on your phone? Because it can do, you can do a lot of stuff like do push notifications um, when you've got the, the Home Assistant app on your phone. Uh, back in the day, I guess going back three or four years, we used to do this via um, either different channels, like have, if you're going to pipe it out to say Telegram or whatever, you, instead of having just one room, you have like a room that's prioritized, that's favorited or whatever, and it's for emergencies versus other types of things. Uh, the surefire way, and I'll do this in quotes, is, you know, like text messaging. So if you push notification to Telegram, but you get an SMS from, from somewhere, you know that the SMS is probably super important because that will cover you if you don't have data or, you know, on various devices. And there's all kinds of ways that you can set that up. I'm not sure if either one of those would, would be of interest. Uh, yeah, what would you suggest for a, a SMS integration? It's hmm. a good question. I'd have to go look to see what the what the current um, what the current situation is. We used to use one called Twilio. Um, I'm not sure what where that stands now because I haven't used that in several years now. And as you know, support changes for various things depending on what the upstream provider allows you to do. So Home Assistant kind of has standards in terms of what things it kind of officially will allow you to do if the upstream provider, you know, removes parts of their API or whatever, um, then those, those providers are usually shied away from in favor of other providers. I, I believe that there's, there's two ways. So Twilio, I think is still a supported method. I think you can also do a GSM modem into your home assistant device and then you can actually put a SIM card in it and it can send text messages. I had forgotten about that. Yeah. Oh, you know, really? the, the only thing, so he, you're right. Uh, Steve's right. The, that is going to be the most reliable way to get out because it's, it's going to a lowest common denominator. The only thing that would concern me is you would want to make sure that you have access to the thing that you're receiving SMS messages on, right? Like one of the advantages of going the telegram route, or in, in my case, it'd be the element route is that you can, access that client from any device so your cell phone falls down and breaks even if you have a replacement on the way and you can't activate that sim card you're still getting those notifications because you're signed in on a backup device into telegram or you're signed into your laptop or something like that right um so i think there's i think there's a there's positive sides and there's negative sides it just it kind of depends on what you want to be your your lowest common denominator for you is that cell phone service or for you is that an IP connection. Um, and, and I would use that to kind of guide my decision of where am I going to have these, these critical alerts delivered. Um, Steve, I think you touched on this, but the app itself can be configured to do push notifications. So if he just wants a really simple way to send those notifications to his phone, wouldn't, wouldn't the app be a great kind of a good way to get there? Well, that's the direction that I would go nowadays because they have different types of, um, integrations depending on whether it's an iOS or Android device. So for example, like um, on Android, you can actually make use of the um, the alarm system, right? So you know how you get some sort of like alarm coming to your phone, like weather alerts or whatever. You can make use of, of some of those APIs depending on the, uh, the, the type of device that you have. And it can even do things like I'm looking, I'm specifically talking about Android because I don't have an iOS device, but you can, you can actually have it do text to speech. Um, so it can actually do text to speech and you can even, there are examples on the website about how you can have it blast full volume, the text to speech, if it's a super important push notification. So, I mean, I would, I would look at that. Um, although you do have the same factor that Noah was talking about, if you kind of lost your phone, um, you know, that's unfortunate. Okay. Yeah, great. I got another question too, if you have time. Sure. Um, you know, I was talking about using uh, uh, different devices to monitor different things around my house. And uh, one of those devices is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm programming it to uh, to monitor the, the level of water in my sump hole. And I'm wondering, is there like a different, maybe a different type of enclosure or maybe a different uh, small computer form that I should be using with uh, 
you know, with screw terminals. You know, the the header board on the, the Raspberry Pi is fine for, you know, making connections to my breadboard with, with jumper wires to make an LED blink. But mm-hmm. when I want to do real things with it, you know, I'd rather have a better connection than that. So I guess it would depend on what it is that you're trying to achieve. There are, there are little devices like, so I tend to build off of the uh, ESP8266 or ESP32. And these are devices that run like, uh, well, the ESP8266 is somewhere between two and five dollars, and the ESP32 runs five to twelve dollars, depending. Um, and these are like full-blown, you know, integrated circuit chips that you can plug actual circuit, like actual um, external devices into. So, for example, like um, I have one of these driving the light that I made for my son. It's a little traffic light, and I got some LED boards and uh, a relay, uh, sorry, LED lights. So like legitimate LED lights that you'd have on the wall, like those types of sockets. And I got a relay and just plug these into the relay and it controls the relay turning these things on and off. So they're, they're quite extensible if you're willing to kind of put a little bit of work into it. Um, and chances are someone out there has probably tried to do what you're doing and has written up some sort of guide on how they did it. I'll throw a plug in there for the Argon One. It's uh, probably one of my favorite Raspberry Pi cases, if not my favorite Raspberry Pi cases. So going through it briefly, one of the things I like, it's an aluminum case, fits the Pi 4. It has, it moves the HDMI and the Type-C and the audio jack and the Ethernet all to the back of the Pi. So the way that the board is oriented there, instead of cables coming out like an octopus, it all comes out one side, which I like. But the other thing is it particularly relates to your, your question about how do I go from science project over to practical use. There is a magnetic removable cover that gives you access to the GPIO pins. So it, and then they're labeled, right? So you take the little magnetic thing off and you can mount the Argon 1 up as if it was a, just an appliance box. And then you can, put, uh, you can use jumpers to get on to those pins. Um, and then it doesn't look so much of a science project. Now you're still going to have the the wires exposed and you're still going to have the pins exposed if that matters to you. Um, but we've done that plenty of times in security installations uh, and it, it looks well enough. Okay. Yeah, I'll check that out. Thank you very much. You bet. Thanks for the call. 855-450-NOAA. That's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. Our third email comes in from... John. John writes in and says, Hi, Stephen Noah. I love the conversation about the AltaSpeed migration from the cloud to the data center. One thought I had in response to the single data center not being very high availability, since AltaSpeed Technologies is already hosted in DigitalOcean, then it seems to me that the missing secondary data center should be DigitalOcean. Noah, you're totally on the right track in my opinion. Looking to offer a service with G Suite and others do, I would beg to be a customer. Thanks. John from California. So, Steve, I we, we had talked about this even before we went on the air last week, but um, we're looking to do a follow-up conversation on that, and, and, and we're going to be doing that in the next few weeks. Um, so if you have questions or you have thoughts for Steve and I, send them in now. And, and, and as we continue to progress down that conversation and as we continue to explore exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and how Steve's wealth of knowledge can kind of guide us, I think that'll make for an inter- interesting discussion. Your thoughts, Steve? Yeah, I think that um, these are the sort of questions that I was looking to draw out and we'll continue to kind of push you on to see um, what to- what stones we can overturn. I think the um, because the goal here is to reduce the dependency on, on a cloud provider for you know various reasons, I think we might have a chat about bursting into the cloud as opposed to having a permanent um, presence in the cloud. And that's kind of a more advanced um, procedure. Like you need to be a little more of a mature organization in order to uh, start thinking that way. Mm-hmm. So I think that these are kind of topics that we'll, we'll try and pick up when we have a, a little more time for this. Absolutely. Our fourth email comes in and the uh, emailer writes, hi, Noah, I have a ZFS server which contains a few data sets that I would like to make encrypted backups for. I don't have too much experience with encryption, but I do know that TrueCrypt was really great for file encryption software of its time. My plan is to set up an Ubuntu machine with Veracrypt 
mount an external USB drive, create an encrypted partition on the USB drive, and then copy files from the ZFS server to the USB drive. Do you have any suggestions on how I could do this better? Specifically, I'm looking for advice on, is VeraCrypt an industry standard for file encryption? Is mounting a USB drive on Linux machine that is on the same network as the ZF ZFS server the best way to copy a large number of files from a ZFS drive to an external drive, or is there a way to directly mount an external drive on the ZFS server? And what software would you recommend for file copy? Something like rsync? Thanks for all you do, and for the show, RC. Steve, what are your thoughts? So I don't see virtually anyone deploying Veracrypt, mm. but my note here is that like industry standard is really fluid. Like I'm dealing with um, organizations that, that take a long time to do a thing and not necessarily the agile organizations. So Lux is still king. It still reigns supreme as far as I, I have seen. Uh, Veracrypt seems to be picking up speed for people like... Uh, small businesses or people like you and I who are kind of tech enthusiasts. So in terms of that, uh, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I do. So um, I, I would, uh, like you, I mostly see people using Lux. And if I'm asked to, to implement anything with encryption, we're always going the Lux route. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, Lux, so Lux, the way that Lux works is the actual encryption key that encrypts the data is stored in the header and then you encrypt the header with your passphrase now the reason that's important is a couple of reasons first of all it allows you to use multiple pass uh passwords so you can have multiple people that have the ability to de decrypt the header thus get access to the private key thus get access to the data and that can be helpful if in a scenario where for example we are going to set up an encrypted backup for a client they pick a passphrase or a password we pick a passphrase and now we are able to access their encrypted data. We're able to do the backups, do all the things. If they ever want to lock us out, they have the opportunity to do so. The second reason that that's important is in the event that you ever have uh, some sort of uh, drive corruption in, if you were, if, if the entire drive is encrypted and, and, and you, you get that bit change and you lose access uh, to that, to the private key, you lose access to the data. So in in this case, the as long as the header isn't corrupted, you're still going to have access to the private key, you're still gonna have access to the data. The other thing, and I've not personally done this, but I understand that it's possible, you can separate the private key so that it's not even stored on the drive on which the encrypted uh, data is stored on. So those would be some of the really good reasons to use Lux. You can also, oh, by the way, tie that into uh, your hardware authentication keys, things like the YubiKey if you'd like to, um, to get a little bit more physical security. And so this, you go back to that 2FA thing, something you have and something you know. Reasons you might want to use Veracrypt. Veracrypt um, and, and, its, and its predecessor, TrueCrypt, kind of came into the spotlight, kind of came onto the scene uh, in, during the Snowden stuff because that's what he allegedly used to, to, to store a lot of his data. And uh, Veracrypt, the successor to it, it has been around for a while and there's a lot of people that do use it. Um, the, 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 the claim to fame, so to speak, is the ability for hidden volumes. And so the idea there is you go to mount an encrypted drive, you type in one password, and it unlocks a vault just like you would expect it to, except the files aren't necessarily the files you're actually trying to keep secret. That's a pretend vault. And so you can put some incriminating looking data and somebody thinks, oh, they've given me access to his encrypted drive. Look at that. Um, but it's really a, a it's it, it it's an ability to kind of trick the attacker because the truth is if you enter the real passphrase then you get to the real container that has all of your real data, um, and according to them there's no way to detect this hidden container. So those would be some of the reasons to use Veracrypt. The other thing that I kind of like about Veracrypt is you can store the data in files, for lack of a better way to put that. Um, and so what that allows you to do is bounce between platforms. And so if you're going between Windows, Mac, Linux, that kind of stuff, very difficult to do that if you're using pure Lux. Um, not so difficult to do that if you're using Veracrypt. So if you're one of those people that are in between making your migration to Linux, that'd be another reason to consider Veracrypt. But the other thing, um, you say you're using ZFS. If you're using ZFS, you could just encrypt the ZFS data set and you could send that encrypted. And so far as I understand it, the only uh, requirement downside stipulation is that you have to do that upon the data set creation. Once the data set is created, you can't go back and re-encrypt it. So you have to decide on encryption before you roll out the ZFS data set. 
Um, but if you're doing that, I think that's a decent way to go. So let us know right back in. Let us know what you go with. Now, we have we got a number of follow up emails when we started talking about our this open source challenge. And so to briefly summarize kind of where we're at with it, people have written and said, hey, go ahead and try open source. Now, Steve and I uh, went I downloaded it. I installed it on a laptop and we we're kind of chatting about it. And the problem is. Both of us are finding a hard time to find inspiration to do this. And from my perspective, yes, I can load it up. Yes, I can get Element and Firefox and Thunderbird and the terminal working. And then I get and I'm like, all right, so it works. Now what? All we've essentially accomplished is it does the same thing that all of the other distributions do, um, except it's a little less, well, it's a little more esoteric than the other distributions. So we asked, who is the target use for OpenSUSE? And man, did you guys respond? You responded in a big way. So we've kind of consolidated all of that email. And basically, the answer we got, who is open source for and how should we evaluate it? Well, the answer is it's a general purpose operating system. And how should you evaluate it? Well, you should look for the things that sets it apart from other distributions. You want it something to be particular. You want it to stand out. You want it to be unique. You want it to have a personality. So each distribution has that. That's part of what makes Linux great is that we have all of that choice and all of that uniqueness. And this is an opportunity to kind of dig into that open SUSE part of it. Um, so Steve, <laughs> dare I ask, how far did you get? I got as far as downloading the Tumbleweed ISO and I, I struggle with the same thing. Like uh, in my Fedora install, I have Firefox and Terminator, and that's it. And so I was really struggling with, okay, so I install this, and then what? Like, it seems to me that when I was when I was looking through the emails talking about what's great about SUSE, it all of the bullet points are basically like it can do everything that you're already doing, and I don't mean that to be disparaging mm. because that is that is a thing. I when I tried. OpenSUSE last time, which was years ago now, it couldn't do all the things that everything else was doing. So, I mean, the the fact that it's coming towards parity now is definitely a big plus, but how do you evaluate something when um, I wouldn't have done a Fedora review if I was, if I, if I take this from the, the different angle, I installed Fedora just to see what it was like. I wouldn't have done a review if I didn't run into these weird little paper cuts that I had because it's the same kind of criticism if unless it's on my main machine where I'm trying to do gaming and I'm trying to do the video editing and the blender work that I do um, there isn't much work like my ancillary machine is basically a terminal and IDE and a browser and that's it and so how do you really evaluate an operating system like as long as you can install the stuff and it doesn't crash okay yeah. So we're going to continue to dig on it and we're going to continue to iterate on it. And we're going to try to find those personality things, the things that make the distro stand out, the thing that makes all of you say, this is the desktop distribution that I would use if I were choosing one. And here's what sets that apart. And here's what makes that special. That's what we're going to focus on. That's what we're going to try to find. That's what we're going to dig into. And if we come back to it and it just turns out to be that, yep, it's a distribution. It runs like all the other distributions. Um, we'll just tell you that. And but if, if not, and we find something particularly unique, then we'll point that out. And if you know what that is, then write in live at asknoahshow.com. Let us know what specifically we should be looking for, what we should concentrate on. Kapavik writes into the questions bot. Again, questions, colonlinuxdelta.com says, what's a good starting project for someone who's wanting to get into the smart home, home assistant world? So Steve, Kapavik's a newbie, wants to sit down, wants to play with home assistant. He's heard the love. He accepts the message. What now? So the, the two uh, normal starter projects are try to automate some lights in some fashion, whether that's buy a smart bulb that you're comfortable with or a, like a, you can buy smart socket that you, know, you don't have to rip your wall out for that just sits over top like an octopus um, and try turning things on and off. And the other one that's really popular, but only for homeowners, is trying to automate your garage door. Um, this takes a little bit of guts because you have to, um, you have to essentially wire your garage door into a relay, but it's not that bad. A relay is basically just a, you can think of it like a drawbridge. When it's down, the power flows through it. When you pull the drawbridge up, there's no power. 
So it really isn't, it's not a complicated wiring situation. And so it makes it for a really good, hey, I did a useful thing with, with Home Assistant. You know, I'll take a variation on that. I, I actually started with Volumio and here, here is why. I started using it just as my alarm clock. Hey, in the morning, play this playlist. And that turned out to be a really good way to go because it has since evolved into, there is a, uh, I, f I forget the name, Clear Tones, that's the name of it. I'll put a link to the show notes. There's a guy that um, set out to make the least intrusive tones possible. And so he takes the stance that a lot of artificial things are are harsh on your ear. And so if you can, if you can listen to the side of a dinner glass dinging, um, that is more pleasing and less stressful to your ear than an artificial tone of, of, um, of similar frequency. And so he released a, a, a thing called uh, clear tones. You can learn more at cleartones.net. Um, and you can download the entire pack for like, I, I think $17. Yeah. 17 bucks gets you all of the tones. And so I downloaded it I bought it years ago, and I, I've just loved them. They've just been fantastic. And I've assigned different tones to different things. Hey, here's here's what, here's what the early wake-up call so that I know that's the last opportunity I have to get out of bed before I have to get out of bed. The next one's a little bit more aggressive, and it's, hey, get up. You can't wait any longer. And then I've got a series of tones that keeps our family on track as we go through our day. Here's when you need to be done working out. Here's when you need to go get breakfast. Here's when you need to be out the door before the kid's school goes off. And that kind of allowed me to, it's very simple because you're, you're starting with a single script and just saying, Hey, play this, clear the, clear the, clear volume, you'll play this playlist, set the volume, stop. And then you're just replicating that script and automating at different times and playing the various tones at different times. And so, uh, fairly simple and straightforward to set up and a wide range of possibilities. And so you combine that with lights. Now you have the ability to full on set your mood in your house. Um, so that, that's a great idea. I would also suggest starting with the Raspberry Pi. I've seen people, um, I mean, if you're comfortable with, with servers, then you can you know, go the container route or something like that. But I've been really impressed with just download the Pi image, stick it out there, stick it onto an SD card, throw it into a Raspberry Pi, start the thing up. And Bob's your uncle. You have a Raspberry, you have a uh, home assistant appliance and they just so, go ahead. I was just going to say, so I'm sure that I've told, you know, how I ended up getting into home automation and my troublesome switch. Right. Um, so for the audience, when I, a long time ago, I was traveling for work. Well, I used to travel for work all the time before, in the before time. Uh, and I had this 10 gigabit switch that the state table fills up and then the switch crashes. And this is a known problem, although sadly not known to me when I bought the device. And the only fix for it is to pull the plug, clear, uh, let it sit, and then start it up again. And when I was traveling, this was hugely, hugely irritating because it connected my NAS to my home lab. And so the thing that I didn't want to do was like, hey, Rosanna, my wife, can you go plug, you know, pull this plug? And then I'd get a series of pictures. Which one is it? And we'd have this back and forth <laughs> sort of situation. So um, I got a smart plug that I put Tasmoda on without having anything else in my house just to simply turn the silly switch on and off. And that's what sucked me in. That's what got you started is, is, uh, is band-aiding a, uh, a budget neck, neck, neck gear switch. Yep. And from there, it just kind of expanded. I ended up having two, three, four different Tasmoda devices and one or two is fine. Cause you manage it by going to the devices, uh, web UI and, you know, tooling around that way, but I got to like 10 and I'm like, this is unmanageable. I need to figure out how to do this. Uh, and that's when home assistant was born in our house. If I can turn that off remotely, I can turn anything off remotely. Yeah. So, uh, it's for Kapavik to, to circle back to your question, pretty much anything that you would find useful, like a, a, a task that we would consider toil, like turning this silly switch on and off mm. was, was immensely helpful to me. I felt like an animal. Yeah. Our pick of the week, or gadget of the week this week, is the Black Magic Atom 1ME. So as we get into 2022 and we're looking at our plans for 2022, one of the things we're going to do is look at doing some video stuff. And I started to look into doing video switching. I've had 
fairly ridiculously bad luck with USB video interfaces. They work as long as you're willing to abide by seven or eight little weird uh, circumstantial things. And as long as you're willing to troubleshoot them, unplug them, plug them back in, do all of those kinds of things, you can get them to work most of the time until you run out of USB bandwidth. And then there's workarounds for that. You can use a PCI card with an individual um, a PCI bandwidth, or excuse me, an individual USB controller, four individual USB controllers on that PCI card, and you, you can get them to work, but it's a lot of work and it's a lot of pain. And so I started looking for what can I just buy and get this to work, did a bunch of research, talked to a bunch of people that are doing this, and we landed on the Blackmagic Atom 1ME. So they make a couple different versions of this. They make the larger brother of it. The 1ME is, so far as I understand it, the the least expensive units, about 2500 bucks that you can do SuperSource. And what SuperSource allows you to do is essentially superimposing one image over the other, which is necessary for doing lower thirds and those kinds of things. So the thing I like about the one ME, one HDMI port, 10 SDI, uh, SDI inputs. And so if you're not familiar with SDI, again, HDMI, commercial version of HDMI without all of the copyright stuff that comes with it, all of the copyright protection. So you can go straight from our SDI cameras, we can bring video signals in, we can do all the switching. Um, has a total of four keyers, three Lumas, one Chroma. Now, there is Windows software, Mac software that is required to do some of the configuration. And um, you can run that in a VM. It connects over the network, so it's not really an issue. Um, and after it's configured, yeah, you know, if all you want to do is do switching, you don't necessarily have to do any configuration. But once you get all of that set up, you can disconnect the Windows software. You don't necessarily need it. And what I'm doing is pairing it with a Stream Deck and the companion software, which it allows you to do uh, automated switching. And so you can have the little LED or the, the LCDs show up for source one, source two, uh, you know, whatever it is, and then have it automatically switch based on what bu button you're pushing on the Stream Deck. And that companion software can actually run on a Raspberry Pi. And so now we're back into kind of the open source world where I just have a hardware thing that's making some decisions and I just get a program output feed. And I can send that out to a stream. And, uh, to, to me, that's incredibly powerful. So if you're looking for a way to do video, you're looking for a way to do video on somewhat of a budget, and you're looking for a way to do professional video on a budget, and you don't want to deal with the compromises that come with consumer-grade crappy USB cards, the Atom, Blackmagic Atom 1ME, absolute great way to go. Pair that with Companion and the Stream Deck, and Bob's your uncle. In the news this week, Firefox 95 is with us. This is shipping with a new sandbox technology called RLBox. So this was developed in collaboration with researchers at the University of California, San Diego and the University of Texas. And that makes it easy and efficient to isolate subcomponents to make the browser more secure. So this opens up a lot of new opportunities beyond what has traditionally been possible with the former process-based sandboxing. So this new technique, which uses WebAssembly, isolates potentially buggy code, and then it builds a prototype that they shipped last year to Mac and Linux users. Now they're bringing that technology to all supported Firefox platforms. That includes all of the desktop and mobile. And going forward, they're now going to be able to treat modules as untrusted code. And assuming that they did that right, even if there was a zero day vulnerability in any of them, in theory, this should pose no threat to Firefox. Now, all major browsers run content inside of sandbox processes, and in theory, this makes it, uh, this prevents it from exploiting browser vulnerabilities to compromise your computer. But on desktop operating systems, Firefox also isolates each site into its own process in order to protect sites even from each other. Looking at you, Facebook. Threat actors routinely attack users by chaining together two or more vulnerabilities one to compromise the sandbox process containing the malicious site and another then to escape the sandbox. And this is where RL box comes in. Rather than hoisting the code into a separate process, instead they compile it into WebAssembly and then compile that WebAssembly into native code. So RL box is a huge win on several fronts. First of all, it protects users from accidental defects as well as supply chain attacks. And then it also reduces the need for them to scramble when issues are disclosed upstream. And so as such, they're going to continue to apply more of these components going forward. Plasma Mobile Gear 
is out since its inception. Plasma Mobile has been used or has been using the Ophono stack for its tele uh, telephony functions. So things like mobile data, calling, SMS. With the latest release, Plasma, uh, Plasma Gear is now transitioning to Moda Manager. So Ophono is a Nokia Intel project that was started back in 2009 with the Nokia N900s, a little blue slider phone um, that had the little built-in keyboard. And it integrates with the higher level Conman Connection Manager, which is currently being used by projects such as Ubuntu Touch and Sailfish OS. And they maintain their own series of patches on top of the stack in order for it to work for their use cases. Uh, by contrast, Modem Manager is a free desktop project. It was originally started in 2008 with the idea of providing USB dongle support for desktops. So if you had a little LTE dongle that you could plug in and you wanted it to communicate with it, this was an open source way to do that. So this integrates with the higher level network manager and network management daemon. It's currently used on Plasma Desktop and the GNOME Desktop to provide support for USB modems as well as on Posh for uh, telephony functions. So they, they fixed a connecting plasma mobile uh, to an external uh, to an external display previous to this there was a issue in Kwin where if you tried to request more video memory or well Kwin would request more video memory than necessary and this ended up leading to a failure on the pine phone so now that that's fixed plasma is able to deal with multiple displays across the board and starting with plasma 5.24 you'll also be able to use a primary output concept and this is going to help you ensure that the main components stay on the display output that you're looking for them to stay on. They should be able to use apps on external screens and out of the comfort of external keyboards and mouses it also will be possible to switch between the plasma, the classic plasma look onto a desktop system but they don't have the automatic adjustment in place quite yet. And so this kind of touches back on that whole convergence idea. They reworked the internals of the top panel and the quick settings, making them extensible. So now it's possible to create quick settings. Um, one of the developers also added the ability to open the clock app by tapping on the top panel and the label and fixed the freezing issues in the quick settings, um, which happened with certain scaling. They also adjusted the buttons and their appearance. But the largest visual change that was made is, uh, is in Cocoa which is the introduction of a mobile bottom navigation bar. And this uh, makes it much more sensible and faster to navigate Cocoa on your phone. The nav bar comes with the new overview page that contains all the previously displayed images inside of the sidebar sections. And this allows you to filter by location, by date, by network folders. Um, this feature was implemented by Devin and uh, Mikhail Johnson. Alexi, uh, in, uh, worked on improving the Plasma dialer by splitting it between the background services and a GUI client. And so starting with this release, NeoChat is uh, the matrix client and it's going to be uh, the part of the monthly mobile release. Uh, so NeoChat's prior release was roughly six months. And so this one contains a lot of new features and fixes. For example, uh, they've now introduced spell checking in the input box and custom emojis and fixed the timeline layout as well as various problems that occurred during startup and shutdown and account switching. So my hope with Plasma Mobile has been and continues to be that last week we touched a little bit on the GPD Pocket and the idea of having a Linux power computer in my pocket has been and continues to be very appealing to me. To date, the best way I've found to accomplish that is with things like the GPD Pocket. But my hope is as things like Plasma Mobile continue to take off and continue to, this has gained traction and, and, and is improving way faster than I ever thought possible, way faster than I ever thought it would. If you would have asked me two years ago, do you have any interest in Plasma Mobile? Do you have any interest in alternative mobile operating systems? I would have said they're, they're likely not getting anywhere. And, and then I tried Sailfish and I was like, wow, this is actually a better experience. It's just not very well known. And now you're, you're watching simultaneously a bunch of mobile operating systems just sprawl. And part of it is a lot of the individual open source components are there and are being distributed around. So it's the whole, all the boats are rising as the tide rises. But the other part of it is there's just some really bang up job development work going on. And we are skating towards some really usable projects very quickly. That makes me pretty happy. Steve, have you played with mobile operating systems at all? Or are you just kind of like, hey, you know what? I install Android and I leave it on my desk when I go home for the evening and my laptop's good enough. 
I will flash lineage on my devices, but aside from that, I haven't really done too much. Okay. So I, I've played with lineage. I, I think it's good. I think that if we're looking to separate ourselves from Google and Apple, and that's at least kind of the boat I'm in is I'm constantly looking to wind that dial back as much as I can. Part of what I, I guess is, is, is concerning to me is it seems like we're starting to use the phone as a cryptographically unique thing to identify people, right? And so we're starting to use, if your bank, you want to log into your bank app, once they authenticate onto your phone, then they use that as a way to know who you are and say, yep, we know that this is Noah logging in. And so I, I kind of push back on that a little bit and say, say, okay, I understand that's what we want to do. Now I want to raise the bar and make it just a little bit more difficult. I want to go use just a plain Linux desktop computing environment. And if I can get that, on a mobile phone, all the better. So continue to watch it's Plasma Mobile and places like Pine Phone take off. Hey, the music in our ears, that means we're out of time. You can follow us on Twitter. Stay up to date with the latest. You can follow the show at Ask Noah Show. You can follow him at Linux Ovens. Myself, you can follow me at Colonel Linux. This show is recorded every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. We record at AskNoahShow.com. We'll see you next week.